for the third session of Covering Rare Diseases Day One, we are greatly privileged to hear from the central player in what is arguably the biggest news story in the history of genetic therapy research. In just the past week, the United States Food and Drug Administration announced that it was nearing approval of the first medical therapy that uses gene editing to treat sickle cell disease, a blood disorder that deforms cells and causes tremendous pain, infection, and fatigue for people who live with that condition. Today, Victoria Gray joins us from Forest, Mississippi in the United States. She is the first person in history to undergo a revolutionary gene editing technique known as CRISPR, which allows scientists to make very precise changes in DNA much more easily than they've ever been able to before. Victoria will be joined by Portia Gabor. She's a multimedia reporter, producer, and news anchor for TV3 in Accra, Ghana. Portia was a 2022 Covering Rare Diseases Fellow, and she's here today to tell us about how the program fueled her reporting about rare diseases over the past year. Victoria and Portia, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Before we hear from Victoria, which I'm sure we're all extremely excited to do, I'd like Portia to start by just telling us briefly about how her NPF fellowship experiences may have uh, influenced her approach to exploring rare diseases in Ghana. Thank you so much, Rachel, for this opportunity. So prior to applying for the Rare Diseases Fellowship, there was a story online that caught my attention. There was a couple in Ghana who had left their four-year-old child in the forest to die because the child had a rare disease and they felt that child was an evil child. So they left the child in the forest to die. So there was someone hiking who was passing and heard the cries of this little child in the forest and then gathered many people to go rescue her. And when they came back, unfortunately, this child passed on and this child died. And it tells you the hidden trauma that persons with rare disease go through because they are not supposed to come out. No one tells their story. So the Rare Disease Fellowship gave me the opportunity to amplify the voices of persons in the rare disease community whose voices cannot be heard. I have a bigger platform. So through this fellowship, it gave me the opportunity to reach out to persons in the rare disease community. Unfortunately, in the newsrooms, there's no funding for rare diseases, even though it's very important. And the focus is on business, the focus is on politics and economics. And you actually have to make a case to your news editors that you need to do the story on rare disease. So this fellowship also gave me the opportunity to get resources to fund my stories. And I must tell you that it has not only benefited me as an individual journalist, but persons in the rare disease community, as well as the medical community in Ghana here as well. So thank you so much for the opportunity. Well, we'll hear more from you later about some of the stories that you've developed over the past year, but I am excited to now introduce the 2023 Rare Disease Fellows to Victoria Gray. I first learned about Victoria through the work of uh, someone who worked at National Public Radio, where I used to work on the science desk, Rob Stein's story about uh, what Victoria was undergoing captivated me. And we spoke to him last year, and now we have the honor of meeting Victoria. Victoria, start by telling us a little bit about who you are, where you were born and raised, and your family. Well, I'm Victoria Gray. I'm now 38 year old mother of four and a wife. I was born in um, Jackson, Mississippi, but I grew up in a very small town, which was Goodman, Mississippi, with my grandmother. And um, so from the age of three months, that's when I was diagnosed with sickle cell disease. That's when I had my first crisis. So um, that was challenging and made my childhood very, very rough. Because I had a lot of hospital stays, a lot of pain, a lot of fatigue. So, 
that also caused me to have a lot of restrictions as a kid. So I couldn't play as long. I couldn't uh, participate in PE. And um, so that kind of what it my disease progressed over the years. Every year that I got older, I had more and more hospital stays. And so that means more and more crisis, more and more blood transfusions. And my dosage of pain medicine went up also. So it, it was just a hard life from my childhood into my adulthood. Can I ask you at what age you were when you were fully able to understand what was going on or what sickle cell disease meant? I understood it early on because I used to love to read. So I looked up my disease in elementary school and um, I knew what it felt like to me, but I didn't know any other people in my community that had sickle cell disease. I was the only child out of my mom, four kids, and my dad's, um, he had four more that had sickle cell disease. So that left me in a lonely place. I, I did research, but all I found out was that I was doomed to die. That's an incredible statement to make for a child to have to grapple with. When During our prep conversation, I, I wanted to be sure that we aren't going to be too intrusive by asking questions, but I I would like you to possibly share with us what a pain episode for a sickle cell, person living with sickle cell is like. Um, can you do that for us? Yes. Um, the pain episodes, they will come on random. I mean, I could wake up and feel good. And then in a matter of minutes, I have pain that would possibly start in my leg or even my arm. And then it would travel across my chest into my other arm. It felt like I was being struck by lightning because it moved so fast, like electricity, and it would just bounce all around my body. And I felt like I had been hit by a truck also because this was a pain I couldn't rub out. We tried all the recommended re remedies, meditations, hot towels, massages. I would even have real strong pain medicines at the house. Like I had Dilaudid at home and that wouldn't even stop my pain. And it was everywhere and it was breathtaking. It um, a lot of times took away my full ability to walk or use my arms. Now, as a mother now yourself, I'm just wondering if you have any insights into what your parents must have gone through uh, trying to figure out what was going on or watching you suffer. What was that like as a child? It was very hard because my mom, she would have to miss a lot of days from work. I did not live with my dad at all. So um, that was a distant relationship. So I saw firsthand more so the emotions of my mom and my grandmother because I lived with my grandmother full time because my mama did work in a different town. So um, it made me sad because I could hear my grandmother's prayers out loud. Just begging God, you know, to give me some relief to take away my pain. And um, I knew my mom was tired. She, I would have crisis sometimes two, three o'clock in the morning, waking up out my sleep. So they would have to get up out the bed and see about me. So I know there was a challenge to have for your child to have pain, and you have no ability to stop it. What you just said earlier about uh, reading up on this as a child and understanding what was happening and thinking that maybe you would never grow up or never have a family of your own. Um, how did you then, you know, once high school is over, et cetera, what were your plans? What were you thinking about what the future would look like? I still was hopeful as a kid, you know. Um, so after high school, I did go to college to pursue a nursing degree. So I entered it, but my health declined even faster. I had my first child while I was still in college. And then I um, I took a break after I graduated from the CNA program. And um, 
Then I had two more, but as I, I was still getting older, I went back to school, but my health really failed me. Um, in 2010, I had my longest hospital stay. It was from mid-October during my fall break um, from college, and I didn't get out the hospital until about January 12th. So um, I had to go through full rehabilitation to learn how to walk and stand on my legs. I had to um, have rehabilitation for my arms also because I couldn't even feed myself. I relied on the uh, nursing staff, the CNAs, to give me a bath, to help me put my clothes on, everything. The pain was so severe. So after that, I knew that I just had to had to stop trying to go to school and just focus on my health and focus on my kids. I want you to bring us to the moment or the point at which someone or some organization came to you and said, we think you might be a candidate for this experimental treatment. Talk about that. Okay. Um, I got a call. My doctor got a call from Dr. Frangu about a, do she have any patients that would consider bone marrow transplants? So she thought of me because I had called them in the room just a few months earlier and telling them that I couldn't live like this anymore. I was just suffering too much that something had to be done to keep me holding on because I was tired. How old were you so, at that point? When she, ma'am? How old were you at that point? I was 31 years old, yes. I was 31. No, I was 32. So um, I had called them in the room. I told them I couldn't live like this anymore, and they didn't have any answers for me. So a couple of months after that, she, my hematologist, Dana, she called and she said um, she got a doctor contacted her to see if she had any patients that would be interested in just a regular bone marrow transplant. So I went to Nashville to see Dr. Frank Gould with my brother and my husband in hopes that my brother would be my donor because we had the same mother and father. Um, he would be my closest match. And he was. We started that process far as the testing phases. But while I was in Nashville, I had a very bad crisis. And I was just feeling real down, real low. I was already worried about the um, chance of getting graft versus host disease from the bone marrow transplant. But I was willing to take that chance, even though that was scary for me. So at that time in that hospital stay in Nashville, Dr. Frank Gould, he sat beside my bed and he asked me, have I ever heard of CRISPR? And I told him, no, I hadn't ever heard of it. And he sat down and he explained to um, my husband and I what that what it meant, um, how it would work uh, in theory, you know, because it had been tried. So and he explained that I would be the first person to do it if I decide to say yes. That must have been an incredible moment for you. Uh, it, in a way, you'd be rolling the dice and being the first person to ever do this. How did you and your husband talk this through and work this out? Well, I I had two questions for Dr. Frangu. I asked would I have a chance to that who was Dr. Frangu? Tell us who he is or he is um one of the head um hematologists over there at Sarah Cannon in Nashville, Tennessee. So um I was there for the transplant, and then he that's when he explained about that. But when he answered my questions about if it didn't work, could I do still do the transplant with my brother? And that was a yes, but I would have to wait a year. And then if I had a chance of getting graft versus host disease, and he explained that there was no chance of that because the cells that I would be receiving would be my own, so my body wouldn't fight off itself. So after that, I felt real confident in that procedure, but I did have to come back to my faith and, and pray. I sought God first. And I said, if this is what you have for me, give me peace in my heart and remove all fear. And um, needless to say, um, the fear was gone. I said yes to Dr. Frangu, and this was within a 24-hour period. Can you quickly tell me what you say you're concerned about getting a certain disease? It 
Can it was it? it's a disease called graft versus host disease. And it's when you receive donor cells and your body don't recognize it. So your immune system starts to fight against those cells. And Dr. Frangul explained it would feel like to me as though I had lupus. And that made me afraid of trading what I knew, which was sickle cell disease, for something unknown. Before we we go any further, I wanted us to revisit one of the things we talked about in the prep conversation, and that is your experience as a woman of color dealing in a, a crisis health situation and how sometimes issues of equity, how we're treated in the clinical setting, uh, becomes a real barrier to our, our health and our access to quality health care. So tell us a little bit about some of the things you experience in the hospital setting. A lot of times I was treated very poorly. Um, I had a nurse to tell me that all sickle cell patients were destined to become drug addicts. We couldn't help it because we had been on medicine for all these years. And we now we end up in the ER just from withdrawal pains. And we wasn't really in crisis because we was now addicted to the drugs. And that that meant everybody with sickle cell disease. And he said he felt sorry for us. And this was while I was on the table in crisis. Couldn't even stretch out my legs. And he just looked at me and I could tell that's what he truly believed because of how he said it. And then there was other times where they leave me in the waiting room from anywhere to six to 12 hours without treatment while I'm out there hurting and crying. And I just, I see, I saw a woman come in, a white woman, and she just had a swollen eye and they took her before me. So, um, it's just been very difficult trying to navigate this um, disease in and out of the emergency rooms. And I've even um, been tested on uh, unknowingly. Um, one nurse gave me a very high dose of fenugreek instead of my pain medicine. And um, I had been in the hospital a couple of days. So um, I called for my medicine. She came in, said, I'm giving you your medicine. It knocked me out. I was asleep for a few hours and I woke up. I was in more pain. And I, I said, I don't understand why I'm hurting. I thought I was getting better. I said, the medicine must no longer be working. She said, oh, no, I just gave you a very high dose of fenugreek because I just wanted to see if that would help you. Mind you, my doctor hadn't even had that medication ordered for me. I made a complaint to the staff and they just said, oh, because she didn't mean it maliciously, she was a new nurse. We're just not going to let her come into your room and treat you anymore. But she's new and they just wrote it off. My my safety, my concerns, none of that mattered. I um, don't know what to say at this point uh, about that, but I think one thing that I do want to do is leave plenty of time for the journalists to have questions for you. But uh, can you please just sort of give us the overview of what the CRISPR therapy process was like for you? Was it painful? Was it lengthy? Give us as much as insight as we can get. Well, to um, it was lengthy because I was the first. It was a lot of testing that I had to go through. And once I started the actual treatment and getting my new cells, the chemo portion, the um, side effects from the chemo were bad. I had sores in my mouth, so I couldn't eat for two weeks. I lost my hair. I was very weak, and I had to be under isolation for 30 days. And then after the treatment and I came home, the taper off the um, pain medicines that I was on because I was on Oxycontin, um, fentanyl, and Dilaudid. So I had to taper off three um, high-dose pain medicines. And those were during the time where COVID began, and it was hard to get those medicines. So I went through a very tough withdrawal phase. But after that, my life has really been transformed. 
I haven't had any emergency room visits, any blood transfusions. I now work a full-time job. I now take care of myself. I don't have anyone um, that I have to pay to come over to help me get dressed or clean up my house anymore. I get to live life as a normal person now. How long after the beginning of the therapy did you start to have that kind of relief? How long did it take? It took about eight months before I really noticed a change. It had started changing, but I went through it. It was a mental process also, you know, like what's going on here. But it's, it was exciting. One day I woke up and I didn't feel any pain. I thought my body was numb, honestly. I started pinching my face, pinching my thighs, but I felt that pain. So I was like, oh God, this is finally work. It's working. So I was in disbelief. What an incredible experience. I'm going to, before we go to, to Portia, allow for uh, one journalist who is, is uh, raising her Zoom hand and I know she's going to have a Great question. So Karen Weintraub, um, welcome to the conversation with Victoria Gray. Thank you so much for telling your story. It's so incredible uh, and incredibly moving. And I'm sorry you went through so many awful things. I was just wondering what it's like now to have such a different future ahead of you and and kind of what 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 the future looks like to you now. Uh, yeah, it, it's amazing. Um, I can dream again because I had stopped dreaming and hoping for anything, you know. Um, so now I have big dreams and big plans. I, after the treatment, I wanted to be a sickle cell advocate. So I, that's what I've been doing since I've been treated because I didn't want to open the door and not help others to come through the other side because it's a great feeling and I want other people to experience that also. I have about 37 questions, Victoria. But again, I'm going to hold my myself together here and talk and ask for Portia. Um, I'm interested in how you approach this reporting um, topic in a country where uh, access to, to education about rare diseases, to genetic therapy, to uh, some of the tools that people in the United States and other countries take for granted. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit about how you, you approach it. Okay, so in Ghana, 17,000 babies are born with sickle cell disease every year. Many parents do not even know their wards have sickle cell disease until their first pain or crisis. And sometimes they only get to know that they have sickle cell disease until they are age four or age five years. And for example, um, Victoria is talking about CRISPR, bone marrow transplants, but I bet you many people are not even aware that these are available for them to access treatment. So even the medications that they take are so expensive that they cannot afford to buy when they are struggling to even make $1 a day. So it's a whole lot of issue here in Ghana. And you, as a journalist, you just cannot do the story and leave it hanging. They expect you to be a change agent. They expect you to be their mouthpiece. So sometimes you get persons with sickle cell disease, instead of going to the hospital, rather come into the journalist to help them access treatment because they feel we are advocates for them. So um, in terms of bone marrow transplant, even though it is available, those who need it are actually not accessing it. And those who are accessing it are just few. They are the elite in society. And for CRISPR, as I did a story on that and many people are wondering when will this come to Ghana and it raises issues about health equity. It will take like 20 years for persons in developing countries to access this kind of treatment. So they hear it, they're wondering, so Portia, when, when will this come to Ghana? And I'm also hopeless. So what I can do now is to follow up with policymakers and make a case for persons with rare disease to let them know that there are treatment options available. What can we do as a country to make 
treatments accessible to those who truly need them. You cannot do just a story. So I, I did a news item recently on persons with rare disease who are even not in school and they, they do not even, they cannot access healthcare. And it's not enough to just do a story and then leave it hanging. There was a, a student who was writing an examination with everyone else and had a rare disease that cannot even hold a pen to write. And she's being graded as everyone else. So after doing the story, I had to follow up to the Ministry of Education because she failed the examination through no fault of hers. I had to follow up at the Ministry of Education to make a case for her. And funny enough, they didn't even realize they were discriminating against the student with rare disease till I stepped in and then they had to make a case for her to go to progress to the next level. So sometimes you just cannot do a story and leave it hanging, but to progress further and speak to advocates, speak to policymakers to ensure that there's change in society. So at times when I'm quiet and I don't do stories on rare diseases, I get phone calls and they are telling me that I'm supposed to be their mouthpiece. So if I stop doing stories on rare diseases, it means they, are mouth, they also do not have the voice to also speak out. So it tells you how important and the role of journalists in ensuring that the voices of persons with rare diseases are amplified. Can you tell us about the the one story that you did about the family with four uh, children with rare diseases? Tell us a little bit about that one. Okay, so there's a village in Ghana called Asesewa, and I was told about a family. Uh, they had four children living with a rare disease, and in Ghana, there are myths surrounding rare diseases. Sometimes people feel that just your association with someone with rare disease means they will also get a rare disease. So they were being called derogatory names in society. They couldn't mingle with other people in society and they were crawling on the on the ground. So for the parents, they felt it was a curse. Maybe they had done something wrong. They didn't even know that it was due to genetics. So I went to the village to do the story on them. And the firstborn was 15 years old. And she's never stepped in school before. She's never seen the classroom be before. She's only been in her house because that is where society has limited them to. When they go outside, people will tease them. People will make fun of them. People will bully them. So they're just home. They've not been to the hospital before because they are even there's so much stigma surrounding rare diseases. So I go there, do a new story about it and educate them to tell them that it is through no fault of yours that you have a rare disease or your kids have a rare disease. It's actually genetic. Then I got into contact with rare disease Ghana, who are, as we speak, they're trying so hard to get their samples taken so that they go, they take their samples outside for testing. That's the challenge. They cannot test them here in Ghana. So they have to test them, take their samples outside Ghana for us to actually know what their condition is. But the most important factor is after I did the story, I followed up to the Ministry of Education and had to make a case for them that these children are being denied their rights to education. And as we speak now, they are now in school. For the first time in their lives, the four of them are in school enjoying their basic rights to education. And it tells you that every child deserves the rights to education, including those with rare diseases and disability. This is powerful, powerful testimony about the role mm -hmm. of a journalist in educating the public and getting that information out. I want to pivot quickly back to Victoria before I actually allow our journalist from Nepal, Swarup, to talk about the uh, sickle cell in that country. But Victoria, when it comes to understanding the process of CRISPR and the research that was going on, uh, how were you able to, to stay informed? Were there counselors? Were there uh, other resources made available to you to help keep you informed? Well, I basically received all of my information from Dr. Frangu, and he gave me the links to watch about it online. And because I was the first person, it wasn't a lot that I could see. And um, I didn't want, honestly, I didn't want to know too much of the what ifs because I didn't want it to affect me mentally. And I didn't want to go into the process expecting bad. I went in with an open mind, expecting that it would be life changing for me, just based on my faith and my faith alone. What did you say to your children? 
how do, how are you able to communicate with them not only the physical challenges you were having, but uh, this this treatment, this process that you were undergoing? Okay, because I had I already got to the point where I couldn't hide my disease from them because they they saw me laying around, and so they knew I was very sick. And my son teacher called me and she actually told me, she said, Jamarius, he's acting out and I know why. She said, he's acting out because he believed that you are going to die. So that touched me and um, it hurt because I had those same feelings. So I couldn't dismiss my my children's feelings, feeling like they were going to be without their mom. And gonna have to grow up without me. So um, I had I called him in the room and I spoke to all of them. I said I've been presented with opportunity to um, have a treatment to treat my sickle cell disease, and I said um, I believe it's that it's gonna help me be better, so I can be here with y'all. I said I'm doing everything I can to live for y'all. I said, I told him, I said, I want to see y'all graduations. I want to see your weddings. I want to be able to be in the stand at your football games. So they said, Mama, um, we know you're going to have to be gone for three months, but we want you to do this. They were all so tired of me suffering. You know, my daughter would text me while I was in the hospital and she said, Mom, I was crying last night. I said, Jadeja, why were you crying? She said, because um, I saw them put you in the ambulance. So I started crying because I knew you weren't going to be here. And we had to go and stay at somebody else's house. So we were all just tired. So I had to have that conversation in, with them. And they was, they was open to it. I feel like you have now... Four young human beings in your life who have not only wit witnessed history, but have benefited from the example of a mother who endured so much for them and uh, came out victorious. I'm I'm getting choked up here, so forgive me. But what an incredible story! Um, while I pull myself together, let's ask Swarup. Uh, to join us and talk a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your experience of sickle cell disease in Nepal. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, in Nepal, the, in the western part of Nepal, there's a small indigenous community, which is typically known as Tharu community, which have the sickle cell uh, disease. And it's very prominent in the in only particular in that community. We don't have uh, this disease in any other community in Nepal. But in Nepal, we only have one trans bone marrow transplant center. So, and there's only two beds. So bone marrow transplant is not an option here. So they have the most of the patient even don't. Uh, get diagnosis well, and uh, most of the patient, as when I go for the reporting, I find them in very pain, painful conditions, and then they die young. With the and even the they, they 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 the community even don't know that there is a treatment and they they can survive if they have a treatment. Which is which is very painful to uh, for us like to deliver to them that it's it's not the uncurable disease in today's context, but yes, people with the disease die very young, and I uh, the hearing the story of Victoria, I I I I I really appreciate her struggle. Most of the people here in Nepal with this disease are just even trying to uh, get the drugs hydroxyurea, which is which is like 
uh, 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 prophylaxis that that we are, that can be given to them, but they don't have even the access to this this cheap drug, and they die young. It's uh, so I I I can like contemplate to the Victoria's struggle and her accomplishment and i'm really touched by her story and i wish i i, I we could do the same thing for the people here uh, with the sickle cell disease thank you i think this gives us uh, a heightened imperative uh not only for um, organizing this kind of training but uh, personally i feel inspiring each of you journalists in your various uh, countries and regions and neighborhoods to reach for what it is that it is possible for you to do in terms of raising awareness, uh, getting information, and perhaps having an influence on uh, policymakers. I want to uh, acknowledge Rupsa Chakraborty. Rupra, Rupsa is uh, from India. And I believe she has a question for uh, our panelists. I don't have a question. I just wanted to share one experience of, <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm so emotional with uh, Victoria's uh, story that, uh, sorry. So the thing is with sickle cell um, disease, we know that there is no medicine, there is no proper diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But when I had gone to the rural areas and villages in India, uh, so the in sickle cell patient, many of them develop complications like cardiac arrest. Many of the young children, they die because of cardiac arrest. But most of these patients are not even certified as a sickle cell disease. So in India, which has a huge number of patients who are living with sickle cell, they don't have the, have the number of uh, um, fatalities related with sickle cell. So in India, we lack the basic information like how many people are actually dying with sickle cell infection. Children who are as young as three years and four years, they are dying because of cardiac arrest, but that's not because of cardiac arrest. It's because of the sickle cell. So we are so far behind. And uh, thanks for sharing your story. I just wanted to highlight this point, like how we lack the data, which is essential to do the um, uh, research. And for policy making, also we need this data, which in India we don't have. And this I have first hand experience in covering sickle cell disease in India. Before we go to a couple of Zoom hands that are raised from uh, Sarah Jones of um, New York Magazine and Julia Metro of Mother Jones, I want to quickly go back to Portia and ask you to 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 talk again about this responsibility. It can, I imagine it sometimes feel like a burden, to be honest, when you realize that the, the lack of information and the lack of resources drives patients and families to contact you directly and expect mm -hmm. you to be able to, to come up with solutions, to, to provide resources. Tell us a little bit about how you navigate that as a journalist. It's so heartbreaking when they, they contact you. Even in my Facebook, I don't, the messages that I get through are persons with rare diseases who are contacting me because they need help. And in a developing country like Ghana, to even access the bone marrow treatments, you must get around $20,000. And as I said early on, these are people struggling to even make $1 a day and they're even thinking of what they will eat and not treatment. So it actually drives them away. There's been times when um, through my TV station, we've been able to raise funds for, for some of them to access treatment. There was one who needed about $25,000 and through the power of the media, the public came together and were able to raise that money for the person to access treatment. But I realized that I cannot do it alone. Um, I am limited as a journalist. I can only do it at a, at a point. And 
I need more of me. So I need to train more people also in Ghana, especially in the newsrooms. I need to educate my editors to make a case for them. I also need to educate the policy makers because some of them are even not aware about rare diseases. So what I can do now is to try and advocate when I can. There are times when I take a break to take care of my mental health because it can also affect you psychologically. So I do what I I can I take a break because you cannot pour from an empty jug and so we just doing I can only do my best and then um, I think the best way to also tell stories on rare diseases is to empower journalists with rare diseases I think the newsroom needs to be diverse they are best when they tell their own stories so we'll need to come together and ensure that newsrooms also have more persons with rare diseases so that we tell the stories better well, clearly, I think you're doing a good job as uh, someone who has been voted Journalist of the Year in Ghana. And <laughs> your profile is strong and your reputation is strong. So we thank you for that. Sarah Jones thank you. of New York Magazine, you had a question. I did. Thank you so much. I mean, at first, I just want to say thank you to Victoria for being here today and sharing your story. I think it's incredibly important for us to hear it. Um I have a, a different genetic red blood cell disease. And so I'm kind of asking that question from the perspective perspective of someone who's a journalist and a patient myself. But um, do you have advice for journalists about how we can go about centering patient stories and our reporting and telling these stories sensitively and accurately, but making sure that your experiences are respected and honored through our work? I think um, when you contact the person, you share the whole story, not just parts. Because I think people need to see us as really people because I was just seeing for a long time as just a sickle cell patient. It was called a sickler, which I hated. <laughs> um, it's like, no, I'm Victoria Gray who has sickle cell disease, you know. And just to share us as a person, and I think it touches people more to see that it's a real per person with a family people who love them and um, who is actually going through a tough situation and need help because I really feel like my job isn't done because I did speak with the FDA and awaiting their decision. It's not just going to stop there because this is estimated to cost at least one to two million dollars. And I wouldn't have had that as a sickle cell patient to, um, to cover. So I would still been suffering. And so it's here, but it's not affordable. So that's a whole different problem. So I think if you just cover the whole person and see them as a person and not just the patient, it will go further. So excellent, excellent uh, point for us journalists to remember. Julia Metro of Mother Jones. Hi, Victoria. I also am someone who lives with a rare disease. And if you're um, comfortable, of course, answering this, I am. I forget the name of the doctor who you spoke with, but I'm wondering if them showing respect for you versus how you were treated in other um, hospital settings, like with the nurse, played a role in you feeling and going for the CRISPR opportunity and the importance of respect in general when it comes to doctors entering these spaces is where maybe they're doing cool scientific stuff, but it's important that they don't um, forget to respect the patient and don't blame them for chronic pain and other symptoms as well. Yes, that played a huge role in me being able to say yes, because I said yes to not only the treatment, but to the treatment center. Because when I arrived there, not once, not once did Dr. Frangu or his team question my pain. They did everything they could to um, make sure I was better. And I could see in his eyes that he wanted better for me just as much as I did. So I felt safe entering that building. And honestly, I believe that if this treatment would have taken place at one of these hospitals that I had a bad experience with, I wouldn't have done it. I would have been more fearful because they've already experimented on me before without my knowledge. So I 
cannot trust them anymore. So that played a big role that he respected me and he showed genuine concern about what I was going through. We have a comment from uh, our journalist from Vietnam, Bu Nguyen. Um, talk to us about um, the uh, situation with rare diseases there. Oh, yes, I'm here. Uh, your comment, you, you mentioned about how people in, in Vietnam use alternative medicine. Talk a little bit more about that. Yes, because um, in Vietnam, uh, many people nowadays, they face uh, some kinds of cancers or maybe rare diseases, and uh, they, they cannot afford uh, going to ho hospitals. Maybe big hospitals in uh, big cities like Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. So they try to use alternative medicine, uh, meaning that they try to use medicinal plants from uh, the elderly, they tell them how to use, how to find this uh, around their home, and they just follow. And some cases, uh, God works, you know, because uh, they are not from doctors, they are not from pro pro professionals, sorry, yes. So just uh, knowledge from the elderly, and we cannot assure that uh, they can treat people. That's the problem in Vietnam now. Do you see uh, cases of sickle cell in Vietnam? I I didn't see, but uh, there's a few a few types of others about this uh, rare diseases. Uh, recently, I just read an article from a newspaper in Vietnam. Uh, a child. They uh, a child he played with mud, and then he got uh, he got a type of rare disease, and luckily, luckily, um, he he was transformed to a big hospital. So, just based on symptoms, and he was treated well. I have to say, Victoria, uh, I think one of the most powerful things I have heard, not only today, but in the process of putting this uh, program together, is when you just said that if this treatment had been offered to you in the setting where you had been disrespected and experimented on, you might have turned it down because you didn't trust those people and and anything that they would have offered you would have would have been suspect talk a little bit more about the importance for journalists to understand how uh, communities that have been historically left out or mistreated uh, what it would mean to them to have access to CRISPR and other genetic innovations man it would it would really mean a lot because just as the sickle cell community, we thought we were forgotten. You know, I thought no one cared about my disease, cared about my pain. And it for it was several times that I didn't even go to the emergency room myself. I suffered at home because I just didn't want to go there in physical pain and endure the emotional pain that they were at. So um, I did have a friend with sickle cell disease, the one person I've ever met besides myself that had sickle cell disease. And she passed away for that reason. She didn't go to the emergency room in time. You know, she was treating herself at home and she was taking Tylenol PM just to help her sleep through the pain. But by the time she made it to the emergency room, she went comatose and didn't wake up so she she passed away and she was only about 23 years old and it was just because you go there and you get treated so bad you know you have to i know this sounds crazy but i had to worry about what i looked like before 
I went to the emergency room. So that means my arms in pain and here I am trying to brush my hair because they're going to look at me if my hair is not combed, even though it's two o'clock in the morning and this pain woke me up out of my sleep. That I was really going to look like a drug seeker. But even when I got all dressed up, it was like, oh, you don't look like you can be hurting. It, it was just a hard, I didn't know what else to do. So to actually have a um, have Chris come along and give us hope, I was able to thank Dr. Jennifer Downer, one of the scientists. You know, thank you for seeing us, for um, working on rare disease, especially for the sickle cell community, who is mainly it affects minorities here in America, and um. We often get looked over and mistreated as our pain isn't real. So to have a treatment that took me out of that environment, I can't be grateful enough. And I want this for all communities. Being able to speak at the summit in London, the international, that's when I learned about the communities in um, India who had populations of sickle cell disease. I got to meet the people from Africa and I even got contacted from people from Puerto Rico who were suffering with this disease. And all of us felt the same. Like we hadn't been hurt. Nobody cared. Do they care enough to make a treatment for us? So me sharing my story gives so much hope to others. And it just brings my heart joy that I can um, help with it. And I know it's a lot that I have to do. And so I, I go, I travel and I speak. I just spoke at a summit in New York. It was for um, the Genetic Center, Centers of Excellence for Africa to help them get funding so they can um, do more genetic research and treat sickle cell disease in Africa. That was where I was supposed to meet you, remember? <laughs> yes. I was there when you were there and I, I did not connect. Um, I think I'm going to steal a few extra minutes with both of you. So I see a Zoom hand, and then I have a very important question to ask you, Victoria. So Swarup from Nepal, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I, I just like to share a few things that in Nepal, the I already said you that uh, a particular community have a, this sickle cell disease. And even if anybody from the family gets diagnosed with this disease, and if the doctors ask the family, other family members to get the test done so that uh, it could be traced if they have a disease or uh, as you, I, 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 I hope everybody knows that uh, the threat uh, of this disease is transferred with, if uh, the person with the tra same threat is uh married or they have a baby with the same trait then it's highly it, it, the baby with the same uh, parents that with the same trait can have this d disease so uh we we educate the this community so to test themselves and not to get married to the, with the same trait but they don't uh, test themselves because they think that if they test themselves and they find that they have this threat, they won't get married ever again. So it's 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 very hard for us as a journalist to make them understand that we are we are just trying to break the chain, but with the cultural thing and the problem with the treatment the financial toxicity uh, people don't get tested and they get married and the child born gets the disease so yeah here yeah. here the role of the journalist comes in where we we try to educate the community to at least to test themselves before they get married so they don't transfer their genes defective genes to their uh, siblings or the uh, uh, children's, but it's very hard to make to make them understand. Uh, it's, it's a it's cultural so, thing. 
It's so important, and it's such an important point that you're making, Swarup, in that um, yeah. if not journalists, who? Uh, how how else would that information get out there? And, and it is certainly valued and appreciated. Uh, before we go back to you, Victoria, I want to ask Portia quickly, do you have any uh, examples or have you had any opportunity to measure uh, impact in terms of policymakers? Have have any uh, people in Ghana who are in a position to, to try, try to create change, have they read or see, or seen your stories and, and reached out to you? Yes, yes. So um, for the Ministry of Education, because of the advocacy work that I do, they reach out to me. And then when they are children with rare diseases that need to go to school, but at home, they've come together to make a case for them. Currently, the education policy, the inclusive education policy is being reviewed in order for persons with rare diseases to have access to education. Recently, I was contacted by UNICEF, that's the United Nations Children's Fund, to host a program. We put together a confab for persons with disability and rare diseases. And one of the most proud moments was that um, they asked two of us to become hosts. And I had to point out to them that the conference is about persons with disability and rare diseases. It's important to give the microphone for them to be at the forefront. I may advocate for them, but they should also join us as hosts so that they tell their stories better. And for the first time, we had a person with rare disease join us on stage to also host so that you give them the opportunity to tell their own story and they do tell their own stories better. And through much advocacy, the hydroxyurea is now free. It's been incorporated onto the National Health Insurance Scheme in Ghana. The only challenge is that when there's shortage, that's when they have to do everything possible to get money to buy. But Currently in Ghana, through much advocacy, hydroxyurea has been added onto the National Health Insurance Scheme. And we are trying so hard to make treatment accessible. There are talks and we'll continue with the advocacy so that those who need treatments like the bone marrow transplants, as well as the CRISPR now, they will access treatment so that no one will be denied their rights to health. That's a, a powerful uh, statement for you. I'm sure, sure you were take so much pride in the fact you were able to contribute to that. I'm going to take one more Zoom hand, and then I'm going to take moderator's privilege and ask Victoria the last question. So Nadima from Ghana, you had a question. Hi. Hi. I, I, I do have a comment to make. And first of all, I'd like to send um, a, a huge congrats to my senior colleague from Ghana, Portia, I, um, I had the privilege of um, understanding her when I was at her network some few years ago, and she's really doing amazing work. Um, she spoke about um, National Health Insurance Scheme, and in Ghana, I, from the work I have done when it comes to rare disease and sickle cell, you realize that usually we have talks with policymakers, and then eventually some of the conditions are put on the national health insurance scheme but when it comes to actually working when you go to the health facilities is nine out of ten a challenge you realize that our policymakers will say oh we have these conditions or the national health insurance scheme is supposed to take care of this and then you go to the hospitals and you realize that it's not working and so most of the families or most of the patients have to pay out of pocket and that is a huge challenge she rightly mentioned that some are even struggling to feed themselves on a daily. And so thinking about access to medication and paying out of pocket is really a struggle. And sometimes it's such a huge burden on journalists because at the end of the day, you can only do so much. You can advocate and tell the stories for um, the relevant stakeholders to watch and then be touched and want to take action. But then you get that people come to you, like she earlier said as well, wanting uh, sources of funding and you're also that there's the you, you might not be in the position to help them with the financial um needs that they need at the moment and so you are forced to sort of um appeal for support on television or the, the on radio etc and you realize that 
a lot of people are suffering, so they might not be in the best financial situation to help these people. And so I'm really hoping, and I always think of how we can move away from the rhetorics and on speaking on issues to actually doing the work on the ground and helping getting real, real, real time support for these people that really need them. So that's the little I have to say. Nadima, I must tell you that, uh, from a personal perspective, after 40 years in this business, I definitely feel what you're saying. I definitely know the, the struggle of uh, navigating the, the line or the fence between advocacy and, and helping people directly and, and staying professional and doing your job. So I, I want to honor and acknowledge your, your comments, but I want to also tell all of you that the cliche that if you can support one family, if you can help one person get access, uh, it in the end it it is it it makes it worth it. I promise you that. Uh, when you've been in the business as long as I have, you will come to that realization. And so, as we wind down, as I said, I'm going to keep you a few extra minutes, but I will take uh, the privilege of asking Victoria. The last question, and we talked about it during the uh, prep session when I mentioned something that I'm sure many of you journalists have heard of, the book called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And this is about the woman, uh, American woman, African-American woman, whose uh, genetic cells, after she died of cervical cancer, her cells were so uh, powerful and incredible that they were uh, contributing to countless research discoveries throughout the, the decades since she passed, and I think in the 40s. Um, and so her family now is able to, to benefit or, or acknowledge her role in history, and uh, medical history. And Victoria, you, uh, without question, undoubtedly are a part of medical history, genetic therapeutic history. And I want to ask you how you navigate that responsibility. Uh, you're traveling the country, you're traveling the world talking about this. Tell us, journalists, uh, what the importance of you stating your journey and telling us about what you've been through. Why do we need to hear that? I think you need to hear it to help bring awareness because there's still, even though I made it over, there's still so many millions of others with rare disease who are suffering. It's one of the hardest things when you feel alone and your you feel like your body is fighting against you. And how do you fight yourself? <laughs> you know, so I think it's important for you guys to hear and the people who are going through to hear to know not to give up that our words and our voice, they are not in vain. It is happening. It may seem slow, but it's a work in progress. And as long as we don't give up, we can bring hope to all these countries, India, Nepal, Africa, by speaking up. It's going to take all of us. And we got to help the people with the diseases no, they have the power to speak for themselves also. So if they feel like they're not alone, that they have someone actually fighting for them, they will give them more power and more courage to speak up for themselves. So um, that's all it's about for me. The reason I travel is to just give people hope and let them know, don't give up. You know, your your voice is going to be louder. One voice connected to another voice, it's going to make a louder sound and a bigger impact, you know, than um, just feeling alone. So I think it's important for the media to share, for me to speak up, and for the patients um, and the people who are suffering to speak up as well. And if all of us go to these governments, they can't turn us down. It has been truly uh, a high point and an honor of my career to be able to interview you and meet you virtually 
Victoria Gray, you are uh, an incredible example of what innovation and technology can do in, in the very best sense of its abilities. Thank you so much for taking time out to, to share your journey and your story with us. I'm sure all of the journalists on this call have been changed by hearing you, you discuss this. And I wanna thank Portia Gabor for joining us as well and telling us and giving us a roadmap to how we can benefit from this information that we're getting in this fellowship and how we can achieve our best selves as journalists in covering rare disease. So thank you both. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. And we will be in touch, uh, not only me to try to meet you later this week, Victoria, <laughs> but I think journalists will all want to, to stay connected to you. So mm. take care. And thank you. Soon. Thank you. Rachel, you can share my email address. I will. We will definitely do that. Okay. And uh, Portia, okay. take care. I'll be in touch with you as well. Yeah. Right. Thank you for the opportunity as well. Okay.